The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. I'm Chris Weekly and uh, one of the founders of Fiat Sense. Um, talk about the, what we've been up to lately and uh, what things we have coming up. Uh, first, an overview of the project, or anyone who might be familiar with it. Um, we're FreeBSD based firewall distribution. We specifically tailor the system to be a uh, firewall or router. Completely managed via web interface, so you don't actually have to know how to configure any of the underlying components in the handler. Um, if you can navigate any typical web interface that probably be a flash, you'll be in good shape. Uh, the config file is, is stored in a single XML file, which makes it really easy to back up and, and restore the system and uh, make scripted modifications if you're going to do uh, large scale kind of deployment. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2004 originally as a fork of Monowall. Uh, Monowall is a great system that's targeted towards uh, small and medium devices and uh, it still fits on like an 8 meg compact flash card. Uh, but there's, and by its design, it's, it's limited scalability. So uh, we started with the extendability as a focus. Uh, the two projects have since diverged uh, significantly. There's not a whole lot uh, in common between them. The, uh, the name comes from making sense of PF for uh, lack of anything better that had domains available and wasn't uh, all over the internet. And uh, initially, I wasn't uh, necessarily a huge fan, but uh, the, the community's embraced it and uh, it's uh, become popular with them. The project has uh, 22 committers currently, people who have contributed significantly enough to actually be able to merge code. Uh, into the code base. Uh, nearing 200 total contributors to the GitHub repo, there's a lot of people who come along and uh, make merge requests for generally minor things, but the, about a variety of, of changes. The moving to GitHub greatly increased the uh, contributions we got from, from outside people. It makes it so easy to send in changes and uh, merge requests and things, so it was a, it was a big positive when we really moved off of CES a few years back. And the stats that Olo gathers on a variety of uh, open source projects, they rank us as one of the largest open source teams in the world. Uh, we have over 174,000 online installations. Um, you can count the number of hosts that uh, update their, their Bogrom's file that, that uh, once a month. And uh, we can count the number of unique public IPs that, that fetch that file to know at least the minimum number of uh, live installations that are out there that undercounts things to some degree. I'm not sure how much, but uh, there's, there's at least that many. Uh, we have several platforms available. The, the live CD and the, the mem stick, they're basically the same thing in two different formats. The live CD is burned to a, a CD. The mem stick is the same uh, functionally, but it's for uh, USB flash drives. It's just generally faster to write out and uh, a lot of times it'll boot faster too than the, the hardware. And then you can actually run from those long term or you can run the installer um, off of them. Uh, most people don't run long term off of those because you're pretty limited in what you can do is that basically everything is read only. Um, now the VST version is intended for any kind of flash media. Uh, it's kept read only mounted most of the time because uh, flash memory has a limited write lifetime. So it's primarily used for compact flash on uh, embedded platforms that, uh, that, that have that as their primary storage option. Uh, but it can also be used with uh, USB flash drives or any, any kind of uh, storage, the primary flash. And we have OVA as well, which is an open virtual appliance, which makes it easier to import into VirtualBox and uh, VMware. Uh, most development now is done by uh, people that we employ. We have support development and uh, other services available uh, at Portland.ps.org. 
we started out doing a typical commercial firewall per install uh, support model several years ago, and uh, almost five years ago we switched over to doing hourly support because we it, it's a much better fit for, for what we do. Uh, a lot of the things that we do break fix on have nothing to do with the firewall, but people start out with the firewalls, and then it's hard to convince them otherwise that they actually fix their, their real problem. Uh, and we're capable of doing that, and we're, we're glad to help people with those kinds of things. Uh, but trying to do that on a, on a flat per install kind of fee is uh, difficult at best. Uh, versus 2003 is the latest official stable release, the previous 8.1 base just came out a few weeks ago. Uh, the maintenance release. And 2.1 was just having a release candidate uh, two or three weeks ago. And that's a previous 8.3 base. The primary changes over the two OX versions uh, was IPv6 support in pretty much every area of the system. And there's a whole list of many other smaller changes that we made. If you, if you want to see the whole list, you can just Google 2.1 site doc.psms.org and that'll uh, find the list. It's pages and pages as well. And we have a, a wide range of, of users, uh, pretty much every imaginable industry. Um, one of the areas where we're most competitive is hiring, uh, in fact, uh, requirements like hosting and publication environments where uh, commercial firewalls that can scale up to large numbers of connections are extremely expensive. Uh, where you can do about one state per kilobyte of RAM uh, with PSNs. So if you get your RAM, you can do near a million connections. Uh, and so most of them are deployed in environments like that. Like a four or eight gigs of RAM can do three to six, seven million simultaneous connections. And that's, uh, that's something in the commercial firewall world will cost up to six figures per system. And if you want redundancy, it's twice that. So for a few thousand bucks, you can have the equivalent of a, basically a house worth of uh, commercial firewalls. So why do you PSS versus just going and configuring all this stuff yourself? Uh, there's, sure you can, you know, build your own DSC system and configure all the underlying components. There's a whole lot more to it than that. Uh, the, the interaction between all the various pieces is where the bulk of our code what it does. And just writing out the config files is a uh, relatively small portion of the total line of code. Uh, there are certain things that have to happen when other things happen, and that's where uh, the bulk of the logic in our code is, the several hundred thousand lines of code. So it's, it's just eases management so you don't have to get in there and configure everything manually and have to worry about how all these other pieces and get interacts and where you have to type a lot of custom scripting and things like that. And a lot of uh, hardcore BSD guys who ran their own firewalls and figured everything manually have come around to uh, understanding how nice it is to have a system that more people are capable of managing. Because they were tired of getting all the 3 a.m. phone calls when something went wrong. And uh, they, they found pretty quickly that with PSNs, they have a whole lot more people who are capable of uh, supporting their systems. And we, have a proven customized OS base that's uh, specifically tailored uh, in a variety of ways to be uh, firewalls and have to worry about what appropriate speech you can put in place or things like that. I have a bit about the, uh, the IPv6 that we've uh, added in 2.1. It started uh, about two and a half years ago and was um, it's been in production since February of uh, 2011, so it's upward of two years uh, at least static configurations have been in production. Um, Seth started because he wanted his employer needed to uh, bring the sites up on, on V6 and this is a typical open source, you know, scratch your, your itch kind of thing. Uh, he works for a large retailer in the Netherlands. He's got upwards of 400 stores and all of their production websites been uh, live on V6 and IPSNs for upward of two years. Uh, all of our production co-location facilities have been uh, live on V6 for right at two years now uh, as well. 
And then additional pieces were added uh, in the months after. So the IPv6 adoption is, is finally catching up a little bit. Uh, I found a quote from back in 2003 in PC world that, that at that point people were expected uh, it would dominate the internet by uh, 2008. Uh, we're, we're finally starting to get there to some extent. Uh, Google hit 1% late last year, uh, finally. And, uh, we're seeing pretty, uh, actually, significantly higher percentages than that on my site. So several percent of our users are coming in over V6. Uh, but as a whole, it's still a, a small portion of the internet. It's Growing significantly, the, the latest stats from uh, the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, one of the largest internet exchanges in the world, Europe is generally ahead of uh, the U.S. in, in deployment, but they're uh, they're up to about eight gigabits per second of uh, IPv6 at peak, which is about four times what it was a year ago. So it's uh, it's really coming. It's, it's not something that you've uh, deployed yet. It's at least time to, to start working with it at home and. Uh, get a good feel for it and understand what, uh, what you're going to be faced with because it's going to, at some point, some killer app or something is going to come out that requires V6 and you don't want to be in uh, fire mode at that point trying to learn it and deploy it for the first time uh, when all of a sudden you need it out of nowhere. The uh, security considerations with IPv6 are largely the same because you're really running the same protocols and with the differences being at layer two and layer three. HTTP is still HTTP, etc. All the protocols you're running are, are still the same, just with different addressing at uh, layer three and uh, different uh, means of sending traffic at layer two. You do need to take some extra care with the firewall rules because NAT is largely no more. Uh, it, it's not in and of itself a security mechanism, but if you would, for example, on a V4 only network with NAT, if you throw in a loud all the one WAN, the only thing absent port forwards or one to one NAT that would actually uh, allow anyone to access is the WAN inside of your firewall. Uh, you do the same with IPv6. Everything in your WAN has a, a real public internet reachable IP, so you would just you would open up your entire network uh, in that case. So uh, just have to be careful what more careful what, what firewall rules that you uh, use. And the other considerations are the same stuff as in V4, except it's different because the mechanisms for that are different. So um, there's no more ARP, but it's now NDP. So there are uh, some changes there where there are ARP issues, uh, ARP security issues in V4, there are NDP security issues in V6. Uh, NDP exhaustion attacks is one of the um, ones that's New just by the nature of, of how V6 works, where there's so many addresses uh, that you can, and somebody scanning the entire network of yours, where with ARP there's a limited number of entries that they can do because the address space is relatively small. With the uh, MDP, there's potentially you know, billions or trillions, depending on the, uh, how much IP space you have configured. So it, it's more of an issue with hardware routers in that case because they keep those things in a much more limited on memory than what you have on something like PSS or any kind of general purpose OS that's deployed as a router. Uh, so that's a, one example of uh, how the V4 attacks have uh, moved to the V6, but for just slightly different. And uh, things like rogue router advertisements, where anything on a network can come up and then start telling machines that uh, it's a router and it's just send traffic through it. Uh, that's something we have to address at the, at the switch level of our work and can't do anything about that. We support several types of uh, WAN connectivity for V6. Uh, static, which is you know, largely the same as static V4. Uh, DHP V6, and all of the dynamic WAN types of IPv6 have prefix delegation. Uh, which is a, a, a different concept from V4, because with V4 with a limited IP space, you just get one address and you add everything. Uh, with V6, you're actually using a real uh, public subnet on your internal network. And where that's dynamically assigned, you have a uh, prefix delegation within um, the protocol that's dynamically assigned your address. So 
you get your WAM site address, the same as you do with, uh, with V4, but then you also, within that, uh, get a pre-configuration where it's telling you, this is the subnet to use on your internal network, or a range of subnets to use on your internal network, depending on how many of your uh, ISPs can you see. And PPPoE also has uh, PD. Uh, Slack is stateless auto configuration, which is generally not used for firewalls, but uh, people deploy PFSense in scenarios where you're just using it as a single interface with clients and uh, maybe it for any number of uh, functions. Uh, not at a firewall, but for a variety of services that are built in. Uh, 6N4 or get tunneling is a, another option that's, that's done statically, that's uh, like what Hurricane Electric uses for their tunnel broker service. And there's 624 and uh, 6RD, and both of those have uh, PE. And those are both types of uh, tunneling in IPv6 over IPv4 within IPv4. Uh, even with thousands of hours of work that went into adding IPv6 support, uh, there were four things that are still still missing. Uh, Captain Portal is a pretty complicated one because of the way that you would want it to, to work. Uh, whenever you authenticate a V4 IP, you would also want to figure out the host V6 IP and uh, let it through as well. And there's a variety of complications with that, so that's not something we were able to uh, complete in time for, uh, for 2.1. Uh, dynamic DNS support's not there, but not because it's really difficult to do, because none of the dynamic DNS providers support quad A records uh, yet. And I'm not sure exactly why, apparently it's coming eventually, uh, at least most of them are saying. Um, but dynamic DNS as a whole is probably going to change conceptually with V6, because rather than running on your firewall, you're probably going to want to run it on your internal host, because your internal host is going to be a public IP directly assigned to it. And generally, you're going to want that to get to a specific host rather than just the firewall itself. But as soon as the providers start supporting that, we'll be able to as well. The, uh, the PPPoE and the PPPP server uh, don't have these things either. There's some complications in the underlying software that it uses that uh, we should be able to address for, for 2.2. I was going to run a few of the new screens that are related to these things. So the interface page we now the IPv4 and IPv6 configuration type shows and uh, just one of them. And you have all the variety of v6 connectivity types that we support. Um, I've just got v 2 v6 set on LAN here. And then if you go to LAN, uh, wherever you have a dynamic uh, LAN with uh, prefix delegation, you just choose the track interface. And then you can look which interface that you want to track. And then whatever subnet comes via that prefix delegation will then automatically be assigned uh, to that interface. And if your ISP is in multiple subnets, um, you can put in whatever the prefix ID is. 
here and you use that particular one. So if you have zero on your land, you can put you know, one on your land two or, or, or what have you. Our rules as well also have the, the IP version now, where uh, you have D4 or only D6 only or a combination of the two. Uh, not all of the protocols can do both of them combined. The, uh, TCP and UDP can, but uh, some of the other ones you still have to uh, split out. There's just a foundation there that'll tell you if you're trying to configure a rule that there can't be both protocols. In that case, you have to do two rules. NAT largely doesn't exist, but we do have an NPT, which is Network Prefix Translation, which is a, a, essentially one to one NAT just on an entire subnet. Uh, the primary usage case is um, you can take your internal subnet and translate it to a different one to need uh, a different ISP usually. So if you're a small multi home network, you're probably not going to have the, uh, the type of connectivity or the, the resources required to get your own uh, provider and an IP assignment from uh, Ireland uh, in, in North America and then have to have uh, a route, a global routing table uh, that usually requires uh, expensive internet connections that may or may not be uh, practical in, in many scenarios in small multi-home networks. So you can assign one of the ISP and IP space uh, to your internal network and then you, you can configure uh, network prefix translation to translate the, the first 64 bits of the address to the uh, IP space of your, your other provider or whatever it's using that internet connection. So if you're using WAN's IP space, you can put in uh, a translation for WAN to and then whatever your uh, internal prefix is and then your, your uh, destination prefix for the external. That is the only kind of NAT that we have for v6 at the moment because it's the only kind that uh, the PS supports. Uh, there is no many to one NAT. Uh, that's something that really should be avoided anyway. Uh, it kind of breaks in the end IP connectivity. NAT is, was a hack that was, uh, was designed to avoid running out of IP addresses and that's, that's no longer uh, an issue in v6. So it's not something that's uh, required anymore. Some people still kind of have it stuck in their head if they want to do that. There can be some legit reasons that you might want to do a many to one NAT, primarily if uh, routing is, is broken. So if you wanted to NAT everything out of one interface to, uh, to the firewall IP on that interface because the hosts don't have proper return routing to the uh, original source of that. So for that reason, you may eventually have uh, the typical many to one NAT that's, that's common in V4, but uh, if or when we, we do have that, I would encourage you not to use it in the way that it's used for before. It, it would just be something that's available for scenarios like broken routing where you can work around um, problematic things like that. And pretty much everything else is, is changed in similar ways to uh, what we just saw there, where there's now, you know, in addition to having a V4, there's also a field for, for V6 where it's applicable. Is there anything in particular that anybody would like to see? Yes. Um, in 2.23, there's a problem with uh, no way to get to the DVD and particularly. Sorry, the question is, uh, will they be running OSPF and BGP at the same time? There's some kind of uh, dependency issues there. Where uh, BGP has its files overwritten. Do you know which files are overwritten? Um, it, it, um, it actually lists, in, we, we, in the list of packages for the um, private version of OSPF, it says this is not compatible with OpenBGP. Open 
That's his back kind of going on here. Because those two do use the same file. You can run the two together, there may be some kind of other complication, but uh, no, it's the two OSDF packages. The open OSDF view is deprecated in favor of the, the Quagga OSDF view. And because they use the same binary names, they can't both be uh, installed at the same time. Is there any work to be done to the OSDF view itself? One of the things I'd like to see, and I'm not sure if it'll make 2 2 or not, um, is integrating the routing protocols rather than having a variety of packages out there. Being able to better integrate them by having them in the base system. Um, whether or not that will happen, I, I don't know, but that's definitely one of the things I'd like to see. Okay. Um, I'm pretty interested in like, one of the, um, the two OS wizards. I've never gotten them to work, but they look like I have been using because they always generate zeros. Um, like, so when I think of like having a random one, it gets bigger and bigger than the XU. The question was, uh, the traffic state is to use some sort of wizard. Um, yeah, I tried to make the setup, but I just didn't know how to do it. Yeah, generally, yeah. there is potentially some lack of input validation that it would let you set things up from, but I don't think that that's... I can't remember the last time I go into the wizard would result in, yeah. uh, in that. I mean, if you've got a specific case where you can you can make it break just by going to the wizard, and you can do that to input validation. There is input validation in the wizard to make sure that the yeah, the Q sizes are the same. Like, I think nine times out of ten people are using last time breaks. They need to break two dot one or two dot one. I think that's been improved a bit in either two or two or two or three. Right, but I know it was like a couple year ago. I don't think it's changed significantly. Yeah. The other question I had is I use the VM version of it, and would like to use the either the compare version. There's a, um, for, for bird IO again? Or, well, actually, yeah, or, yeah, or you can do an XMS3 for VM, I guess. You can find the interfaces, but God forbid you reboot it, it will just reboot it. Huh. I've heard that just happen. VM yeah. XMS tends to, and that's going to get better if you're using things that are actually integrating it rather than yeah. doing the hack add-on drivers. Yeah. Uh, so I think it'll be better at that point, and I know that the ones that are, the add-on ones are, I don't think it's for all Q for one, so you can't be traffic shaping with them yet. Um, amongst other potential issues there. And the last question um, is I was trying to, to work with um, And we're, uh, now that 2.1 is getting wrapped up, we're uh, making plans for 2.2. For we're just in the early stages of that at the moment. The, uh, the main thing, and the biggest change that we're aiming for is uh, to get on previous E10 dates. Uh, and that's not released yet. Uh, so we're kind of working through our development process as previous E's working through the development process as well. Uh, it's going to bring a lot of changes. Uh, the SMP scalable PF is work has been uh, committed there. Uh, PF was formerly giant locked. Um, OpenBSD doesn't really have great in kernel SMP support. It can do SMP and user land, but the, the kernel itself has all kinds of uh, single locks. So you can't scale various parts of uh, PF across uh, multiple CPUs. Other things like interrupt handling and uh, things like that in FreeBSD will, will uh, scale. So you do get benefits from, from SMP uh, with FreeBSD. But PF itself is a giant lock, so generally on a very high load 
fire all these T1 core at like 80 or 90 percent utilization, and the rest at like 25 or 30. And that's in uh, change some, uh, it, the more CPU intensive parts are capable of uh, soothing that load. But for the very, very high end uh, scenarios, that will uh, greatly improve scalability. And the, the wireless support has been vastly improved, uh, 802 L11. And is uh, finally supported, and uh, Adrian Chad, who works for Theros, has been putting a lot of uh, after hours effort into the, the drivers for all of their various hardware. So basically, every Theros chip that, that exists, uh, and some that aren't even publicly available yet, but are being uh, developed internally there, are, uh, are supported. Uh, we've been Enhanced cards there for uh, for redundancy for high availability, where currently you have it's it's the same as VRP or HSRP, where you have to have one interface IP on the primary, you have to have one interface IP on the secondary, and you get a shared card IP. So if you don't have three IPs on all of your interfaces, you can't do uh, fully safe and fail over at least. And with the card in the ten, you can just have a single IP um, per interface and uh, be able to use card. And there's also a lot of possibilities for alternate um, architectures, the things like MIPS and ARM and things like that. Historically, we haven't really bothered with them too much. Um, there, are, there always has been some has been some support uh, in previous years where the architectures has just gotten a, a lot better with uh, the newer versions. Um, they used to be pretty limited on resources, but we're not really competing with GDWRT or, or things like that. We're, we're a significant step above that. And having to rip out a lot of functionality to fit on some of the uh, tiny routers is, would, just wasn't really worth the effort and not really attractive to, to, to our user base. Uh, but now those, are, those architectures have grown significantly and have a lot more RAM and flash available. So that's, uh, that's going to be a possibility for uh, most of them uh, to that next phase. And a lot of other, what happens is kind of unknown at this point. We just got our all of our kernel changes up to date for uh, for DSC 10 and that was actually submitted today. Uh, partially unknown because we just haven't really had a chance to talk about it much yet. And partially unknown because what we do is largely dependent on what uh, what customers are interested in. If somebody you know, pops up tomorrow and wants to fund the routing protocol integration, let's say, or, or something along those lines, uh, then that would be able to make the release. And the release date to be de 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 determined, uh, a lot of that's dependent on when previous is going to be released, which will probably be in the neighborhood of uh, six months from now, uh, from what we're hearing at this point. But that's uh, in itself to be determined. So I, we'd like to aim to get our release out shortly after previous is going to released. And hopefully we'll be able to make that happen. We're probably looking at probably six months at least for, uh, for that to happen, uh, six to eight, probably. Does anyone want to improve um, SNSMT? Because right now it's a fresh ship. <laughs> what, what do you want to do? It's not fresh. Uh, well, when I pull a Cisco device, I get everything. When I pull a PSM box, I get like maybe CPU and memory and interface stacks, but I don't get VPP stacks. I get the next nine years. It sounds like you don't have all the nibs in there. There's a whole lot of nibs. There's PF nibs, so you can pull a whole lot more uh, data out of it than that. As far as the routing protocols, the routing protocols don't have anything um, for them, but there's there's a lot more than just basic uh, stuff in there. The, I think the I don't remember where the PF nib is available. Um, I don't remember offhand, but if you if you search for PF nib PD uh, PF nib, you should be able to find find it, and that has all kinds of various uh, stats that are relevant to the, the firewall. Uh, but yeah, other than that, these are relatively comparable other than the, the routing protocol. Yeah, 
exactly that's Yeah, that's that's where most people start. Really. You know, put put it in as a home router, and it's you know, largely very much overkill uh, for that purpose. But that's generally where people start, and then after they're comfortable with it, there they uh, generally start deploying it to their their customers, their consultants, or uh, you know, at the office, or in the data center, or, or what have you. Yeah. Uh, we will be doing some uh, training courses later this year, a uh, couple of full days to get people up to much more in depth um, kind of thing. But yeah, we've got a new, new edition of the book coming soon too. And that's a that's a good way to, to go with uh, if that's a if that fits your learning style, then that's a that's a good option. Uh, we'll have a PDF. Maybe I mean we can take the doctor XML format that it's in and put it in the EPUB. It's just I think if we had a PDF that would satisfy most people, but you would still rather have it. I'll check on that. Car would be the line. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, see what we can do. Because I think it's, I mean, we can tell I can see it. I can see it. I don't think it's that hard to do. This is the, the software that we use for. To convert to Docker XML PDF in the current format, I think it can pretty easily convert it to. Yeah. Uh, some of the things we have uh, coming soon, we're uh, finishing up the detail on the certified hardware program where uh, we really have a list of recommended hardware vendors that have you know, platforms that are pre installed, ready to go appliances that we tested out to, to verify that you know, everything works the way it should and that we test out in advance of uh, upcoming releases to make sure whatever it's upgraded, it, uh, it will still work after uh, after the upgrade. Uh, we're going to formalize that a bit more and uh, have a standardized control in effect as well, where people know that they need X packages per second or ranges per second, or that they'll uh, be able to pick the right, uh, right hardware for that. Uh, we're also going to launch a, a Google subscription to content only and backup uh, subscription for uh, users who don't necessarily need or have a budget for commercial support, but uh, want to help support the project. Uh, we like to do things like uh, more comprehensive uh, test QA environments that have uh, to be able to get releases out more, more quickly. If we uh, had a full test environment like that, we can run every single commit through a full range of quite a bit less time to put releases out. And the uh, 2001 edition of the book uh, is pretty much done. I'm, I'm working on reviewing all of the moment and uh, making some minor updates to it. Uh, but it'll be, I'm not sure what it'll be print because the editing process and whatnot takes a while, but we're going to be offering it electronically. Our budget this month is the, the draft version to keep updating it as we uh, go through the publishing process. How will you obtain it? Email me? Or offer anything else? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, if you go to this app, you have uh, and subscribe to our announcement list is there, and uh, we'll email that as a good list to be on if you're interested in the project in general. We lost a handful of emails every year, so there's not, not much volume going on there. So thanks, for, uh, thanks for attending. We got a, a table out here somewhere. I set up uh, yet, but I'll be, uh, not too long after we're, we're done here, I'll be out there, and uh, our uh, friends at NetGeek have uh, given us an Alex to give away, so we're going to have a uh, bowl out there to gather people's business cards or email addresses, and you, uh, we, won't, we won't spam you, we'll just have to go out to your conference and Thank you for stopping by. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be giving this away uh, in 
We've also got other uh, there's another platform that uh, the so we've got uh, and I'll have to be to check out I mean, uh, talking with Dr. McBurger or anything else is Depends on where it is and how long the travel takes. Um, where are you located? I'm in Austin, Texas. So if it's something that I can, in general, it's a thousand dollars a day flat rate plus uh, hotel and then airfare. So that's the easiest way to find out. So. And it's somewhere that's a relatively quick trip. You're losing at least a full day in each direction, so that's the cash and money is on the opposite. Yeah, it's a good I actually successfully got one for me. I can connect the work with my iPhone. But one of my does not get working, it's perfect always since. Is that a stupid Apple thing? Because every time I turn it on, it didn't work.
we start out with a little more than we believe to manage uh, a big central area and centralized uh, place for maintaining laws and things like that. But it's, uh, as we're able to expand it, we've got a whole list of uh, things that we're looking at. But turn it more into a network security monitoring platform of sorts.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. 
Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. 
lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.